Hello, it's Keith here, and this is lesson three of my PDP-11 assembly programming tutorials. Now, we looked at the addressing modes last time, and we did a few basics in the first episode. Now, we're going to continue on. We're going to start looking at flags. We're going to look at condition codes, which, of course, are very important. And we're also going to look at a few other little things as well, starting with looping using the SOB command, which is subtract one and branch. So let's go over to the code for today, and let's see all of this in action. Over we go. Okay, so first of all, let's try this SOB command here with this little loop test here. If we just fire this up here. Okay, so if I just stick this on the top, it's a bit small, so I will read out the contents of the screen here. So what we're doing here is we're loading R1, which we're going to use as a loop counter with three, and we're loading R0 with a value zero here. Now, what we're doing then is we are saying with this sob command to repeat back to countdown the label using R1 as a counter here. So you can see here, that the first iteration, R1 was 3, and each iteration we're adding 2 to R0. And we're showing the contents of our registers just here. So the first time we showed the registers, R1 was 3, and R0 was 0 here. The next iteration, we added 2, so R0 became 2, and R1 became 2 here. And then the third iteration, R1 was 1, and R0 was now 4. Now if I just add a extra execution of the monitors to show the registers at the final state here. I'll just run this again. You can see the final state was that R1 became 0 and R0 became 6 because of course there was a final addition here. Now the sub command is a bit like the DJNZ on your um, Z80 if that's a system you're familiar with. It's a very nice simple little command just for doing a loop. Of course unlike DJNZ which always uses the B register though we can specify the register we want to use here so that's very convenient. So just a, a simple little command but you know it's gonna if we did this with a branch command we would use more commands to do that. We'd have to have a dict command and a branch if non-zero. So this is combining the two into one go effectively. So that's quite handy. Now the rest of this lesson is going to be basically covering the concept of flags and things. Now if you're familiar with another system, and I assume you're going to be, you'll know that flags are a register within the processor that holds the conditions based on whatever previous mathematical operation occurred. Usually they'll store things like zero, if there's a carry, if there's a negative, things like that, and the um, PDP-11 is no exception. Now first of all we're going to try setting and clearing some of these flags and we're going to show the results of this onto the screen. Now we've got a variety of flags that we're going to be looking at. We're going to be looking at negative, so that's whether the last operation was positive or negative. Zero, which is if the last operation caused a zero or non-zero. And of course, if you know other systems, you know that compares are effectively like a negative command. And so if the difference between two registers is zero, the zero flag will be set. We've got an overflow flag and we've got a carry flag. And we can set or clear each of these independently with commands like SEN for set negative and CLN for clear negative, SEC for set carry, CLC for clear carry, and we have SCC and CCC to set or clear all the flags in one go. Now the rather curious thing about the PDP-11 is that we have these sort of defined commands to set or clear the flags and we can set and clear all the flags, but we can actually create a command that would do a permutation and combination of setting or clearing. For example, if we wanted to set the negative and overflow flags together but leave the other flags intact, we could do that. We'd have to look at the actual bytecode that this command, these commands compile to and you will see there's a set of bits allocated to each flag and so we can create a a command that sets a combination, or we can create a command that clears a combination. I mean, I'm not going to cover it here, but it is possible, and it's quite a curious thing within the PDP processor. One thing we can't do is we can't set some and clear others within the same command. We'd have to use two commands separately to do that. I thought it was quite a fun thing to discuss, I'd say a bit of a curiosity of the PDP-11. Okay, so we're going to be trying these commands here. We've got this monitor flags function here, and we're going to be using that, and we're going to just see each of the flags set and cleared, we're going to use the SCC and CCC to do all the flags first. Then we're going to play with the N flag, the negative flag, then the zero flag, then the overflow flag, which is V for overflow, the second character there. And then we're going to do carry last of all. So you can see we, we're going to try a bunch of these flags here. OK, so let's just enable this example and we're, let's give it a go. This time, let's try the R11 emulator. And if I just resize this window here, maybe we can get it on screen at the same time as our code. Unfortunately, my always on top program doesn't actually work on the console windows of Windows um, 
10 here for some reason. So we're going to have to, I'm going to have to avoid clicking on this main window here. But hopefully now we can maybe see what's going on a bit better. Okay, so first of all, we are doing the SCC and you can see here that all the flags have been set. And then we're doing the CCC and that is clearing all the flags. Let's just resize that to my top window up here. It looks a bit more sensible. Okay, so CCC then cleared all of the flags here. And then SEN set the negative flag and CLN cleared the negative flag and says set the zero flag. And you can get the idea. And then here's the overflow and there's the carry flag. So we're doing all of those there. Now, when we got down to here, we were going to try another command. Now, first of all, we set all the, the conditions here. And what we then did is we used this MFPS command, which moves the condition codes to a register here. So we backed them up into R0 here, and you can see that R0 now equals 17. Then we did a clear of all the condition codes, so you can see these went blank, but R0 of course still contained 17. And then we transferred back using NTPS from zero back into the flags here, and you can see that the flags were all restored here. So if you need to back up and restore the flags, you can use these M. FPS and MTPS commands to back up and restore the flags. And that's what we did just here. And um, this is actually sort of being used within my monitoring functions as a way of getting the current state of the flags to show these little characters on the screen. Although we're not actually going to go into the details of how those commands work. It's sort of um, beyond these tutorials. I'm just using them as functions to help show the flags in operation and which flags were set when we're doing our tests. Okay. Now we're going to try this zero flag test here, and we're going to use the zero flag to compare two values and see if they're the same. OK, so what we're going to do first is we're going to do a test command. Now, test will set the flags according to a register. So effectively, we're going to be setting the zero flag if register one is zero. Now, we, you can see we've got two possible commands here. We've got a one that loads a zero into our one, but we're overriding that and loading in a octal 100 into R1 here. Now the idea of this is you would download this code and you could switch bits on and off just to see how the commands are working, which branches are occurring. You can see we've got a branch to show an equal sign here or a exclamation mark equals with the sort of C not equals command there so that we'll be able to see which one of these branches actually occurred based on the test command and the value in R1. If we just fire this up first here. Now you can see here we've got a not equals because R1 had a value of octal 100 here. However, if I rem out this line here and run again, well, now we've got an equal sign because R1 was equal to zero. So that when this test command ran, the zero flag was set and equals is checking if the zero flag is set and not equals is testing if the zero flag is not set. And the way I'd suggest you would think of these commands is that if the zero flag is checking if the difference is zero or not. And it, as I said before, that's because with compare commands, the compare command is a, is a theoretical subtraction. It doesn't change the registers, but it changes the flags if the difference is zero effectively. OK, so there we were just doing a, a test, but we can also do compares. So if we just load our 100 back in and then if we do a compare of R1 and R2 when R2 is 100 here, we run this again. Well, you can see here that the equals flag was set because R2 and R1 both contain the same value. But if we change R2 to 70 here, well, this time they don't match. The difference isn't zero. So we've got the not equal shown here. Now, as I say, these are effectively the same as a subtract command. A subtract command would, of course, change the registers. Now, and rather than doing a compare, we can do a subtract command. A subtract command has the same effect as a compare on the flags, but of course, we'll change the registers. So in this case, our branch if equals will still work just fine because you can see here the equals occurred because the subtraction of 100 from 100 left a result of zero. So the zero flag was set. So let's say that's how we can do the zero flag. The zero flag is kind of the most simple of the options. 
However, when it comes to doing greater than and less than and greater than equals and less than equals, we need to consider whether our registers are being treated as signed numbers or unsigned numbers. 16-bit number can be 0 to 65535 or minus 32768 to plus 32767, just depending on whether we're treating it as signed or unsigned. And as I've said many times, the processor doesn't really know whether the number is signed or unsigned. It just depends how we treat it and which comparison operations we use. So we've got a set of comparison operations just here, and we can do various tests here. Now, here we've got the value 100 in R1, and we're going to compare to 50 in R2. Now, we're going to compare these two, and of course, R1 is greater than R2. So if we do our comparison here, and then we're going to just use these unsigned branches, and of course, R1 is going to be greater, so we're going to branch, and we're going to show a greater symbol here. And there it is, you can see. And you can see that actually none of the flags were set here. However, however, if we use a different value here, if we use 200 and we run again, well, now you can see the C flag and the N flag have been set. And it's the C flag in this case that is causing the branch if lower here. And so we're jumping to this and we're showing a less than symbol. Now, we also have higher and same and lower than same here. So if we gave the test value so that the two matched, well, it would just simply come down to which one was the first in the sequence of comparisons here. And in this case, um, the lower or same has applied first, so we've shown the less than, but if these two were in the opposite order, the higher than would have shown instead. The point I'm making, as I say, we've got these four options for working with signed numbers. However, if we use signed numbers, these will malfunction. Now, minus 200 is of course less than 100, but it's also effectively a very high unsigned number. So if we use these unsigned commands here, this is going to malfunction. So 100 is greater than minus 200. So we should have shown the greater than, but because we used the wrong commands, we've actually treated it as a very large number and said that 100 is less than minus 200 because minus 200 is 65408 in unsigned numbers. So we've made a mistake there. What we need to do is we need to use the signed equivalents. We've got BLT, BGE, BLE, and BGE for the equivalents of BLO, BHI, BLOS, and BHIS. They're basically the same kind of commands. They're just designed to work with signed numbers, and they just treat the flags in a different way. So in this case, you can see we've got a greater than symbol here uh, because we're now using the correct commands. And of course, 100 is greater than minus 200. So it's important to make sure that we use the right commands, either these ones for our signed numbers or these ones for our unsigned numbers, unless our number is unsigned and very small. But you know, we want to make sure we're using the right commands in all cases. So hopefully that's relatively straightforward. I'd say I'm kind of assuming you have done some other kind of assembly before, because as I said, PDP-11 is a pretty old system so if this is your first time learning assembly it'd be an odd choice but I, yeah, I totally encourage you if this is your first choice you know I hope you enjoy it but um, anyway we're going to move on now to the overflow flag now a common thing you need to consider with signed numbers is that the signed numbers are going to have a limit and there's that no limit is going to be around 32768 now, as I said before, a sign number can go from minus 32768 to plus 32767. The problem is that essentially the difference between these two numbers is just a single unit. Effectively, if we take a number of plus 32767 and add one, it will convert to minus 32768. And in equally, if we have minus 32768 and we subtract one, it will convert to plus 32767, which is a rather major problem, really. If we were using that for a high score or a bank balance, we're going to be in a bit of a disaster. So what we can do is we can check what's known as the overflow flag, which is a V, not an O. The overflow flag will check if the sign just changed incorrectly because we exceeded the limits of the register, either in positive or negative state. So effectively, the sign was flipped by the last command incorrectly. So what we're doing here is we've got a test value here. And what we're going to do is we're going to add octa 100 to it. And that is going to cause an overflow. Well, what we're going to do then is we're going to branch. If BVS will branch if the overflow is set, if the V flag set, BVC will branch if the overflow is clear. And we'll show NO for no overflow or O for overflow. Okay, let's fire this up. 
Well, not a very interesting display on the screen, obviously, but we've got an O here because the overflow occurred. BVS branched over here and showed the O because we've added too much and the sign has changed of our register. However, if we added a much smaller number, we're still going to be in within the limits of the signed number here. So this time BVC, branch if overflow clear, occurred and we showed an NO for no overflow. So the idea would be that we would do our mathematical operation and then we'd, we would do a branch if overflow here to, and to a piece of code that would show a warning or would um, you know, make sure that whatever just happened was not a problem. You know, if, if it was a game, maybe you've got to the edge of the screen or something. But as I say, it gives us the ability to somehow cope with the fact that our mathematics are reaching the limit and we can hopefully deal with that gracefully rather than our program code failing or thinking the person heavily in debt was certainly had a lot of money something like that okay now another thing that's kind of similar is the testing of the sign bit we've got these commands here hip branch if minus and branch if plus these effectively just check if the top bit is one or not and we can use them for that purpose if we wish of course because of the way binary numbers work with negative numbers the top bit is always going to be one in a negative number in a signed number and zero in an unsigned number of course they won't work with unsigned mathematics and that's what we're doing here we're going to branch and show a minus here if the negative flag is set, BMI, branch minus, and BPL for branch if positive or branch if plus maybe, and we're going to show a plus here. So we've got a couple of tests here, and um, we can, firstly, we can just, of course, run them without any kind of mathematical additions here. So here we've got a negative number in R1, and so the end flag has been set and we've shown a minus. But if we loaded a positive number and run again, this time, that in flag is not set and you can see we've drawn a plus here. You know, as, as well as that, of course, we can actually add values and that will change the value in R1 in this case. So minus 32 plus octal 100, of course, is now a positive number. So we've shown a plus. And of course, if we added a much smaller number that didn't change the, the negative flag, you can see the in flag is still set and we've still shown a minus. So just a handy way of quickly checking if a value is negative or positive. Now, next we're going to have a look at the carry. We have sort of already looked at the carry because the carry does relate to signed numbers. Um, because of the way the subtractions work, um, a carry will be treated as a borrow and our compare command was using it. But this time we're going to look at it in a more simplistic way. What we're going to do is we're going to take a very high number. We're going to add some more to that number and that's going to cause a bit to be pushed out of the register because the register is now full. It's effectively the 17th bit of 16th bit oper mathematical operations and the idea is we could add that carry to another register to use those two registers as a 32-bit pair. This is very common in 8-bit mathematics for treating 16-bit numbers, especially on the 6502. Um, and you know, we can do that here as well. But in this case, we're just going to show a C or show nothing if the carry has been set by the last command. So in this case, we added octal 100 to this value here, which has overflowed that value. And so we've shown a C. But if we added a much smaller number that didn't cause a carry, then BCC will occur. BCS is branch of carry set and BCC is branch of carry clear. And in this case, we've just shown a little minus here because the no carry branch occurred and that shows the minus there. OK, so that's all of the branches that we have available to us for jumping around depending on the state of flags and just a few examples of how the various mathematical operations will affect those flags. Now what I'd encourage you to do is you know, download the example code that you've seen here today and maybe try some different values of your own just to sort of get your head around them because things like um, the overflow flag, the V flag, I really before I started learning assembly and before I started writing tutorials really, I didn't really have that in my head how that worked because I'd never really dealt with signed mathematics in that way before. And through trying different values and seeing how the V flag changed and seeing, you know, it was very easy to get it in your head. Okay, now I understand what this flag is doing, what conditions set it and what conditions don't. And so I'd suggest you do the same, you know, to please download the source code and the build scripts that I use are all available on my website and hopefully you'll give them a go yourself, at least if you're still a little bit hazy on what these commands do. 
Now, one other thing we're going to look at is the bit command. We looked at the TST command, which would test and set the flags accordingly. The bit command is effectively like an AND command. However, it doesn't actually change the registers. So we can use this to test one or more bits within a register and see if they're set or not. So what we're doing here is we're going to use this value here and we're going to do a bit three here, which is going to test the bottom two bits and see if they're zero or not. And so by doing this here, if we just run this, well, obviously you can see there's a, there's a three there. So they obviously weren't zero. So we've got an NZ here. Of course, if we tested bit one as well, that would also result in an N zero because bit one is of course set here. So you can see an NZ just there. But if we were to test bit four here, or if of course we were to change this to a two, well, bit one is now zero. So the effective result of this simulated AND command is that the zero flag is set here. As I said before, the useful thing about this is that the register isn't actually changed in the process. There may be times where you actually want to use that register value later on for another purpose. And you can see here that R1 was not changed by that bit command. We can do a test, but we can leave the register unchanged. And so if we wanted to use that register later on, we can do so without having to reread it from memory or backing it up. So again, I think that's another handy command for you when you're coming to dealing with the flags and you actually want to test the values of the registers without changing the register and just changing the flags. So there we go. So that's all I wanted to cover today. We've looked at a lot of different flags. We've looked at some conditions and branching. Hopefully, if you want to know more about this, you'll go to my website and download the examples and have a go yourself. We're going, of course, we're going to carry on with PDP 11. We've got lots more to learn. And now we've looked at the addressing modes and also some branching and the concept of the flags. We you know we're really set up to be able to get on with some more content and you know fill out the rest of the commands that we would need to know if we we're writing a program. Anyway, I hope you've enjoyed this. I hope you've found it interesting. If you have, you know, please like and subscribe because YouTube ranks videos based on how many people like them and things like that. So by doing so, hopefully other people will find the content and will enjoy it as well. Um, if you want to learn more about PDP 11 and things, you know, please uh, maybe have a look at my forum or my discord if you want to chat about it. But whatever you do, I hope you enjoy programming, whether it's the PDP 11 or one of the other systems I cover. But thanks for watching today and goodbye.